mostly, but all our models are multi-scale. So what that means is we typically implement cellular and subcellular behavior in our models, and sometimes, depending on the case, can be quite complex, other times less complex. Anyways, we represent the ionic flows across the membrane, and then we plug that in a sort of a um, tissue to whole organ model. In some of our work, we work only with this electrical component, so we focus on the electrical function of the heart. Um, in some of our other studies, we actually have linked through the subcellular calcium handling um, the mechanical component as well. And then you have cellular myofilament model and all the way to passive mechanics, contraction of the heart, and even implementation of the circulatory system. Anyways, today I'm going to spend um, my time talking about the electrical component predominantly because that's the most advanced and I want to get to the clinic with it. So I want to show you that. So as I said, I wanted to give you an idea how we have gone, how computational cardiology can be used in a spectrum of problems from mechanisms to clinical care. So I'm going to stop, uh, start from mechanisms, um, then go to preclinical pre studies, and then, then I'm going to show you our patient work using computational models. So in terms of mechanisms, I want to start with a study um, that we published last year, and it's actually really interesting. Um, so we were not part of that study in the beginning. It was a Stanford group that started that. So at Stanford, in the pediatric cardiology, um, there was a girl who came to the department, to the clinic. She was 10 days old. She has been born with a genetic mutation in her heart. So long QT, QT syndrome. So she had a genetic mutation in the gene that um, underlies the sodium channel. So initially, when they did studies on her, um, turned out that most of the cells that they took from her blood, urine, saliva, they actually were normal. But here and there, they would encounter a cell that had a different genetic makeup. So the girl had arrhythmia, but on the other hand, she had mostly normal cells. So they weren't sure what is happening exactly. So it turns out, um, actually one of the um, co-authors in the paper was a person at Stanford who was specializing in um, getting the genome sequencing of a single cell. So they managed to do that, and they discovered um, that she is a mosaic person. So a mosaic person, or, or can be a, a plant or an animal, is when you have different ma genetic makeup of part of the cells, as if they come from different sources. So the girl was a mosaic person. Um, so they put, she had an arrhythmia, they figured out she was that way, they put a defibrillator, and in about three months, the defibrillator was discharging all the time. Her heart had enlarged really uh, precipitously, so they had to do a transplant. She received a transplant. And you can imagine what kind of a rare situation that is, to have an explanted heart from a somebody who has a mosaicism. So that allowed the researchers to do a full characterization of these two different types of cells. They were able to measure currents, and in her um, mosaic cells, she has a uh, much enlarged late sodium current. So the cellular behavior was different. What turned out actually was that only on average 8% of the cells in the heart express this different genetic makeup. So the question was, why would only 8% of the cells that have a mutation, a long QT mutation, result in an arrhythmia in an entire heart? So we were asked to figure this out. So that's how we came on board. And this was a very interesting case for us. So we implemented, we created a model of the little girl's heart. And um, we created a model of her wild type cells and her mutant cells. And then we distributed the mutant cells um, 
in a variety of stochastic ways. And this is her little heart. And we, we tried a lot of sort of different parameter variation in this stochastic modeling. And no matter what we did, we could never get an arrhythmia. Until we realized that we are not in taking into account something important in the heart. The heart has a conduction system, the Purkinje system. So we realized that if the heart is mosaic, her Purkinje system could also be mosaic. So then we created a model of the Purkinje system in which we also modeled the mutant cell and then at the tissue scale and organ scale and put all that together. And lo and behold, then actually this is her control heart in a normal sinus rhythm and this is with the mosaic implementation. You can see there is a little difference in because her action potential is a little longer, this activates a little later, but you can see that at that point there is some difference and this leads to what's called two to one block. It doesn't propagate on one side, only on the other ventricle and she gets an arrhythmia. So she gets a two to one ventricular block. She, this was a very prominent feature of her um, phenotype. So we were able to figure out using simulations in a real person, what is the um, reason for why this girl um, got an arrhythmia? Um, the girl got a new heart, and she's now three years old. And um, as I said, this was published. So anything that I'm showing today has been published like a year something, maximum two years ago, or it's unpublished. Um, so this was published about a year something ago. And for some reason, New York Times wrote an article about it. Um, on May 21st this year. I don't know why so late and how they picked up on the story, but they wrote about this paper and they talk also about our modeling in it. And it's very interesting because mosaicism is not just something that you can see in the human. Turns out there is an example in this article. It says that, for instance, the grapefruit tree, the pink grapefruit that we eat, was a mosaic branch in one of the trees. And ever since, they use the seeds from these, these fruits to get pink grapefruits. So it's a very interesting phenomenon that occurs in nature. Um, and we are very happy that uh, we were recognized by New York Times. And um, this is the little girl. This is from the press release at Stanford University and her parents. And I, as I said, she's three years old now and healthy with a transplanted heart. So this is very briefly, I'm showing you how using mechanistic simulations from the single cell to the whole heart can be really useful in resolving uh, problems where there is no other way to acquire insight. So I want to move to some of our preclinical studies. So this is a completely different study. It's a study on optogenetics. Optogenetics is the... Um, particularly in cardiology, that is a fairly new branch of science in which the cells in the heart are inscribed light-sensitive properties. Basically, a protein gets embedded in the cell membrane and it is able to pass current in response to light. And so there, were, there has never been, a, before we started doing that, there has never been a modeling of cardiac optogenetics. So we teamed up with a group at Bonn University. They were doing already experiments on mice. So uh, we teamed up with that. And um, I'll show you the study. This is from the press release at Hopkins University after the paper got, uh, got published. It received a lot of publicity. But that's, um, it was in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, a, a very high impact journal. Anyways, the study consisted of the Bond group doing experiments on mouse hearts. Mice hearts. So what they did is they um, initiated arrhythmia in these mice hearts and they did two sets of experiments. In the first sets of experiments, they did transgenic mice that expressed this light sensitive protein called chanurodopsin. And they did it in uh, the mice expressing, also they infarcted them. Um, so they did both cases, so they had also structural remodeling. And then they would illuminate the heart with blue light because chenorhodopsin is sensitive to blue light. And then they demonstrated for the first time you can do arrhythmia termination or defibrillation with light. Then they repeated the experiments with light, uh, 
uh, wall type hearts after gene transfer. So they did a viral gene transfer to embed that protein and then repeated that and was also successful. So this is very good. The question though is, it's a new field and what we felt is that the goal of computer simulations here is not to provide mechanistic insight because they're doing it already. But how do, are we going to translate that down the road in the human? So we believe that the role of the computer simulations of the whole heart here would be to direct the experimental field. You don't want the field to go in a variety of directions. By using simulations, we can translate from the mouse heart to the human and tell the experimentalists what kind of developments need to be made in order to advance that to a translational threshold. So we did that and to, um, to do that, we did simulations with actual um, models constructed from actual patients at Johns Hopkins University. These patients had myocardial infarction and those are um, like, this is one heart. It has, this is the, the scarred area. And they were patients who had actual arrhythmias and even received defibrillators. So we used these hearts, reconstructed them, and then we created a model of the chanuridopsin, and then we modeled light um, uh, illumination in this model. And you can see here, um, this is the arrhythmia in the patient. It's actually, you can see the ECG. Um, you, it's going here through a uh, channel in the scar. And then what we showed was that in order to terminate that arrhyth um, the arrhythmia, you need a different type of light. You need a light um, that has different wavelength that penetrates in the tissue because the human heart is much thicker. So this is a red light. So only if you use red light, we suggested, then you can terminate an arrhythmia of the same type in the human heart. Because if you do blue light and have the corresponding protein, it does not terminate. So here we were able to direct the experimental field to look for different adjustment of these proteins to be sensitive to different uh, wavelengths. And indeed, now they are red shifted um, red shifted um, proteins that are being developed and even used in experiments. So this was um, a sort of our um, sort of, I wanted to give you an example of a preclinical application in which modeling is used in a different way. Um, as I said, the paper received a lot of publicity um, and this is the conclusion from it. My favorite uh, publicity is this one. He was in the mail online, and look, we are together with Kim Kardashian. So that's really when you know you have success in science, <laughs> right? Uh, and she's actually kind of fairly naked here. Anyway, so that's a uh, yeah, big achievement for us. Um, <laughs> so that's the other type of studies I wanted to show you where you're using the simulations to drive the experimental field. I also want to show you another pre preclinical study, which is completely different. And in this one, um, I, had a, I have a PhD and, um, in my lab who also stayed for a postdoc, who also was co-supervised with somebody in my department who was a specialist in MRI. And in this study, we did a very high resolution diffusion tensor MRI. This is for the first time that a human heart and a or an other large heart, we did also pig hearts, has been scanned, the entire heart, in a clinical scanner. It took 50 hours per heart to reconstruct the fiber orientation, not just the geometry of the heart, but the fiber orientation. This is a, this is a very, very high resolution. This is 250 microns reconstruction of human heart, um, 250 microns in all directions. So we are able for the first time to provide non-destructive information about the fibers within the human heart, in the atria, and also in the ventricles. Because previously, for large hearts, only histology has been available in, in reconstruction. It has a lot of problems. So, um, this, so my um, uh, student generated these images. And actually, we participated in a competition for the best unpublished image that um, Nature Reviews Cardiology had. And actually, we won it. So um, 
the price of the competition is that the image was on the cover of Nature Reviews Cardiology uh, for 12 months, each month with a different color. So this is three of the, of, the, of the issues. So we were very pleased with the outcome. Anyways, that's the, the fun part. But also we use that for really um, a, a very interesting studies. And um, this is a paper that just actually got published in Circulation Electrophysiology. Um, and you can see here, this is a human heart, the very high resolution of the scans that we were able to obtain. Um, and actually, basically, you had to scan it all weekend. Uh, and you can see here the papillary muscles and all the, all the fiber orientation. And um, my student used this diffusion tensor MRI scan, those scans together with contrast enhanced MRI, where the contrast provides information where the heart has a scar. And what you sh I'm showing here is, um, hearts, th those explanted human hearts that have had infarcts and we were able to reconstruct them together with the fiber orientation. So we get information about all the structure. And here is one human heart. This is a, um, you can see we also looked at the um, distribution of fiber orientation even through the infarct, which was very helpful for the modeling because in the model you implement both geometry as well as the fiber orientation. And um, we also did a very, uh, that's now published actually, we did also a very extensive study of the distribution of the scar in these hearts. And you can see here that there are a variety of distributions of the scar. This is a very, very high resolution. And you can see here some is subendocardial, uh, some are more sort of intramural scar. You can see surviving areas that are between epi and endocardium, and in some cases, we had mostly survi surviving areas only in the sub-epicardial area. So what we did with these very high resolution scans, we of course reconstructed them and made models out of that to figure out how the distribution of scar in these hearts with infarction actually sets up the stage for an arrhythmia in the hearts. And here is, um, I hope you can see how complex in three dimension the distribution of scar in this heart is. You can see there are channels here and there, all kinds of you know, patches connected and so forth. You can see how the tissue survives in between and how you can imagine a propagation of electrical activity can be going through this very convoluted um, structure. So here is one arrhythmia in one of the hearts. You can see the different types of arrhythmias that can be set up in these hearts. This one has a clear channel. You can see it right here, and the electrical wave goes through it and sets up a reentrant arrhythmia. In this one, the reentry was subendocardial. It was mostly on the endocardial um, surface, if, if you will, on the endocardial layer and it stayed mostly in this layer without going to the epicardium. In this one, um, in this one we have a intramural, so it goes between epi and endo, and I actually have a figure here showing um, how it goes from one surface to another across the, um, and the wall. And so in all these hearts, we had different types of arrhythmias. And what we did next was um, we wanted to characterize the different morphologies as a function of this distribution of the scar. So to do that, we devised an, an analysis tool in which we mapped the surviving tissue surrounding each patch of scar. So we mapped in the normal direction what is the thickness of the surviving tissue, and then we colored the surface of the scar based on the thickness of the surviving tissue. So we get the infarcts, now the scars, colored by surrounding tissue thickness. And then what we did, it, those, are so, those are hearts colored by that, but what we did then is we followed the arrhythmia and then we took the smallest sort of reentrant pathway, the tightest, and we created a one-dimensional loop within the three-dimensional surface of the heart. So it's a three-dimensional 
loop um, that describes the pathway. And then we looked at the thickness of surviving tissue along the pathway. So what we are looking here is to figure out whether the arrhythmia that is set up in this very convoluted, complicated structure has a preferential thickness. Does it go in thick area, in thick channels? Does it go in thin areas? Where does it go? So we were able to trace those, and we constructed these his, uh, histograms looking at the thickness along the pathway of the reentry. And you can see here that um, while the average distribution was skewed towards the thinner um, uh, um, surviving areas, the, um, the arrhythmias, the ventricular tachycardias, were set up in a preferential thickness. And what we found was that all the areas through which ventricular tachycardia was propagating were always less than 2.2 millimeters. Now, this is a very important conclusion. If you know how in the clinic they terminate an arrhythmia in a patient with infarction is, they would go and try to find the channel through which the propagation goes and burn it. So the question though is, there are many, many channels, there are many areas, which one to burn? And that's what they don't know in the clinic. So there are many channels that are just passive propagation. There are others, like if I snip something along this three-dimensional loop, I'm going to terminate the arrhythmia. But if I snip a channel around here, I will not. So this study was very important in understanding that we should not be looking for large areas. Large areas are not those that set up the stage for ventricular tachycardia. You have to look for something. And our clinical scans are not really very good at resolving that. So we need to aim at a resolution that will provide enough information for these channels. So this is a um, sort of a, the, um, the preclinical studies in which we used uh, these very high resolution models to provide. So it's a different, I'm sorry, it's a different type of simulation here. The goal is to understand something that's important clinically and um, how to further drive the clinical procedure from these conclusions here, so they are more successful in doing that. So this, um, this study um, j just got published, actually, and um, they, they did it as, they chose it as the editor's choice. Um, so it's right now online, came a few days ago. Um, so if you're interested, you can take a look. Anyways, so those were mostly studies that were done um, on either ex vivo hearts or some other mechanistic um, studies they were not uh, on a live patient. Um, so what I wanna, the second part of my talk, I wanna talk to you about our clinical studies. And this has been a very big sort of motivation and vision in my lab that it cannot be that in our society we have so much that is driven by simulation. We ride our airplanes like the new Boeing Dreamliner has been entirely designed with simulations. Bridges are built with simulations. Um, now we have almost self-driving cars on the road that are entirely designed by simulations. So our goal has always been to have a simulation that is implemented, implemented in, in the clinic Basically, you have a personalized simulator for the patient's heart, and you are able to, um, you know, use it for a variety of diagnostic or treatment um, options for this patient. So, um, I want to talk to you about these studies now. So, in the, in, under these clinical studies, we basically generate models out of live patients' clinical scans. So a patient comes to the clinic, and you can see here this guy has an infarction, the little white area right here. So we use these models, create a 3D reconstruction of the geometry. We also segment, segment the infarct. You can see the scar here. Now, these are clinical scans. The, the resolution is pretty poor. And so as compared to our high-resolution scans, whether you have a voxel is either scar or not scar, here we have what's called in the um, 
the, the late gadolinium enhanced MRI, you have an area that's kind of purple that is referred to as the gray zone. This is where the MRI scan cannot resolve when you have interdigitation of normal and scar tissue. And these cells have pretty, they're pretty arrhythmogenic, these areas. Um, so we reconstruct the gray zone as well. And we also deal with fiber orientation. We estimate the fiber orientation in, in the patients. I'm not going to talk about that. But we finally construct a geometrical model of the patient. Now, um, in this geometrical model, we implement different properties of the cells. And in the um, normal cells, we have certain expression of channels in the um, the sort of the diseased part surrounding the infarct. We have a different properties, different from experimental data. We have um, a different expression of the channels and we implement that. This is from, um, so I want to point out that the electrophysiology here is not personalized. So we are using sort of an average concept of electrophysiology here. And it's very important that, that as we are going forward with that, to figure out how good such an approximation is. Now, I do not want to personalize this in terms of electrophysiology because the only way you can do that is by taking an invasive measurement. And from here on, all what I'm going to be showing you is creating tools that can be used non-invasively in the clinic. So our goal is to have the best approximation in electrophysiology. And we, we are still moving in this direction. We are creating now cohort-specific action potentials and so forth. But I just wanted to point out what is the goal here with these models. And once we generate um, a heart like that, then we will stress it out. We pace, give electrical signals from many locations, and then we watch where the anarrhythmia originates from this pacing location. So um, in using these sorts of models, we have um, we are, we've gone with them in two directions. One is diagnostics, and particularly prediction of risk of sudden cardiac death, which is a huge problem in our society. And the other is treatment planning, individualized treatment planning for ablation, for burning of the arrhythmia for both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. So I'm gonna start with the diagnostic, and so currently, if a patient has an arrhythmia and has had, let's say, a prior infarction, comes to the clinic, the decision whether to provide this patient with a primary prevention, which is the implantation of a defibrillator, is based solely on one clinical parameter. That's ejection fraction less than 35%. Ejection fraction is evaluated from the ultrasound. It's cheap, it's fast, it's great. The problem is it's not really accurate. So patients get defibrillators implanted, but for one patient that receives defibrillator who truly needs it and for whom the defibrillator will discharge and save the life, you have another 19 that will receive defibrillators who do, do not need them. And you probably know how bad it is to have a device implanted to you that can shock you you know, any time. So these people normally have psychological problems, completely altered way of life and so forth. Nobody wants these devices if they don't need them. So the issue is with the criterion. So what we set up to do is to come up with a better way to evaluate whether a patient needs a defibrillator implanted because they have a risk of sudden cardiac death. So we created what's called virtual heart arrhythmia risk predictor or VARP. And so this is a simulator that uses, uses the patient um, heart to predict whether the patient will have an arrhythmia and we pace from many locations and then watch out whether they will have. And so what we did is we had a clinical study at Hopkins of 41 patients. All of them had ejection fraction less than 35%. All of them received defibrillators. They were quite sick actually patients. So they were followed for up to seven years. We received their scans. We have no other information. We are completely blinded to their clinical outcome. 
We do not know whether the defibrillators have discharged. We do not know anything. We just got 41 scans. And we created the models, and then we predicted whether these patients will have an arrhythmia. And only after we completed everything, we did statistics to compare with the actual clinical outcome. So I want to show you here out of 41, I think I'm showing 22 of the patients. You can see how they have different distributions of the scar of this gray zone, the um, green. They're quite different in their shape, etc. So of these um, 22 patients shown here, we predicted that 22 of these, uh, sorry, uh, no, these were 32 of these 22 um, will have an arrhythmia. You can see it, it developed in, arrhythmia developed in our model. In these, no matter what we did, we never could elicit an arrhythmia. So these, from this particular 32, these should not have received defibrillators. So we did the statistics, and this is our predictor, and this is left ventricular ejection fraction. So they made us do pretty complicated statistics. We had to hire a statistician to help us with that. Um, and here are some parameters that are, are taken out of MRI scans that are used in some hospitals as also a predictor. And you can see here, out of these 41 patients, the hazard ratio, which tells you how accurate we are, it's the highest for our, uh, basically our, pre our approach was the only predictor of sudden cardiac death in these patients. In 32 of these patients, they also did a clinical study, invasive clinical study. They stuck a catheter in the heart and measured the activity, tried to induce arrhythmia. As you can see, the clinical study also wasn't very accurate because they don't have very much access to all the places to induce an arrhythmia. So we were so much better than the clinical study. So basically, this was a very successful prediction of sudden cardiac death or the need to discharge for the defibrillator in these patients. So we, were, um, we created this risk predictor that was novel, non-invasive, safe, and effective. And it's not, um, it, it can radically change the way patients are selected for ICD deployment. So patients who don't need them, even if they have ejection fraction less than 35%, they don't have to get it. Now, on the other hand, if a patient has a ejection fraction currently above 35%, they are let to go home. They go home. Two thirds of these people die of sudden cardiac death. So we wanna capture also people who need the defibrillators although they might have an ejection fraction that's above 35%. And this is for the first time we translated a simulations, which has been typically, as you saw before, more of a basic science tool into clinical utility. So the paper got published in Nature Communications and uh, we got a lot of publicity. This is Nature made it their, um, their uh, uh, feature article. And this is the first authors, the first author didn't want to put, he didn't want to, we didn't want to put any patient data, so he scanned himself, the first author, he was my grad student. And then um, this is his heart and he made it, made it to have an arrhythmia and then we put this image here. Anyways, um, this is the article the Guardian wrote about um, the approach. So it's, uh, it was the first utilization of simulations in the clinic. Um, so now we are continuing in this direction. So what we are doing with this is broadening the scope of diseases to which we can apply that. Before we used it only for patients with infarction. Now we are looking at non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, tetralogy of Fallot, which is a structural congenital heart disease. And these are patients, if you've heard about the blue babies, you know, they have a defect and the blood gets mixed. And these um, kids, they go repair very early in their life. But you get a repair in the septum of the heart, and over time it develops fibrosis and becomes like a big blob of scar. So it also is arrhythmogenic. So we are working with these patients. We are working with patients that have myocarditis or sarcoidosis. These are different inflammatory diseases. And I want to show you um, one of them. Some re uh, results, a little bit of this one. Um, for s so for we have, uh, for some of these diseases, we have a bit of a different approach. 
we decided that we are not going to rely only on the clinical MRI scans, but we're going to merge every possible scan that there is out there available, and particularly for sarcoidosis, the PET scans are very useful in determining whether these patients have inflammation. And so we combine the information from the PET scan together with the information from the MRI, created the three-dimensional models for these patients. The study was of 20 patients. Um, and then we validated the model. Some of these patients undergo ablation and they are mapped in the clinic. So we verified our predictions by comparing to what was recorded in the clinic. And so let me show you, um, as I said, now there are 20 the patients. So 11 of these had actual clinical um, tachycardia, eight had none. And the follow-up was around three years. And we are again completely blind to outcome. So here is um, the outcome of our predictive tool. You can see left ejection fraction is miserable. This is the PET scan. This is enhancement in MRI. So for our, here is the, our approach, and you can see it is the best, but it's not ideal in this disease. So what we did is we decided to augment the approach, and what we did is we did a machine learning and combined it with our simulation approach to create a novel tool to predict that. So what we did is we did a machine learning on images, simulations on the simulation outcome and on clinical outcome. We combined all that. We actually did random forest and um, combine it with our tool. My, um, okay, my pointer died. We combined it with this tool and you can see here that it got, um, it got much better. So, but the most interesting outcome of the machine learning was that the five parameters that were most predictive of outcome were all from simulations. So doing the simulation is very important because this is a highly nonlinear system. You have cell interactions. You have what's called an emergent phenomenon. When you put things together, you get something new. And that was very important. So, this is our current um, state of the art with this disease. And as I said, we are, move, we are doing it in other diseases using different approaches as well. So this was the diagnostic part. So what I want to do in the remainder of my talk is to talk about treatment planning. And this is like, now we are going to talk about ablation for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. And um, I want to start with atrial arrhythmias. And the reason I want to do that is because, yay, this came back. Um, the reason I want to do that is because atrial arrhythmias are the most prevalent human arrhythmias. About 1% to 2% of the population has these arrhythmias. And as the population ages, pretty much all of us are going to get it. Um, so currently, about one out of four people has it, and it's going to get worse. And so this is becoming a major um, healthcare burden. So, uh, and it's huge, a, a multi-billion dollar industry nowadays. So I wanna show you how we wanna use simulations to bring them to the clinic to predict the ablation targets in patients um, with atrial fibrillation. We specifically are looking for patients that have persistent atrial fibrillation. This is the worst case. And in this case, there is no standard of care where to ablate. These are patients that have extensive fibrosis. And in those um, patients, you can see, okay. In these patients, um, you can see here from the images, we are reconstructing actually the fibrotic areas. You can see them right here. And they are very important in setting up the stage for an arrhythmia, so that's very important to have um, these fibrotic distributions for the specific patient. Um, we have collaborated with the group in Bordeaux, uh, the clinical group in Bordeaux, uh, who are really very um, advanced group in ablation. We worked with them um, to generate variety of models from their 
MRI scans, you can see different patients here with different distributions of fibrosis. And then we do the similar thing. We stimulate a variety of locations and we look whether this patient has an arrhythmia, uh, atrial arrhythmia, where it is located, where it is anchored, and how to determine what is the best way to terminate it. So here is an example of one arrhythmia in this patient. You can see this is, it's pretty chaotic looks, but actually there is one reentry right here that is the driver. If you terminate that, all the rest, it's gonna become um, quiescent. So um, you can see here the activation map and here is sort of the trajectory of this sort of organizing center or phase singularity, if you will, around which the wavefront rotates. So this was elicited from one or few locations. We actually, in each patient, we can find where these rotors are anchored. And you can see they are not stable necessarily, but they meander in areas. But this is very interesting. Is in this, we tried from over 30 locations. And from all these locations, there were four potential arrhythmias. And so um, we can see where they are. Now, if a patient comes to the clinic, they cannot see that. What they see is, in a patient, you might have a manifestation only of this rotor driving everything. So in a way, if a patient comes to the clinic and the patient is mapped, they can ablate here, the patient goes home and then comes back because he has a new arrhythmia. And that's the story with all patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. There is no standard of care where to ablate and how to determine um, what are the targets for ablation. So this is, um, our modeling reveals these potential reentrant drivers, not just that are mani manifested clinically in a given episode. So this is how currently ablation is done. Patient comes for ablation, they construct, they map the heart, and then they would burn in areas that they think are good targets. We want to completely substitute that do image processing, predict where is the ablation target, and provide that to the clinician directly. So the procedure is done completely driven by simulations. Um, it, on the modeling side, it's not very simple because what we do is we identify the targets, but then we do virtual ablation to make sure that actually really terminate it, and if new um, drivers arise, then we repeat it, and then finally we get a the ablation targets, and we provide that to the clinicians pre-procedure. We actually reverse engineer the electroanatomical map to be able to import it, so they see on the screen our targets. And so we had a clinical trial, a, a prospective clinical trial, enrolled 10 patients, and we had, uh, we called it Optima AF, Optimal Target Identification via Modeling of Arrhythmogenesis. And then here is like one of our patients. Um, this was a 70-year-old male, had a lot of fibrosis, you can see, previously failed ablation. Um, so we predicted what's going to be the electrical activity there. Here is um, one rotor, here is another one. Um, and that's an example. So that's what we create. We create a video that has all the targets where the clinician should go, and that's basically displayed. Um, on the screen, and they would just navigate the catheter to it. Another, another patient, multiple fa failed ablations, multiple. They were very, so I just want to point this out. These were very sick patients. Nobody wanted them for a clinical trial. Everybody would avoid that. Um, we were the only one who took them, and uh, we did this study with that, but uh, again, to demonstrate that we are able with our methodology to predict what is the optimal targets in these patients. So here in this patient, here is one arrhythmia, another one here, and here are the, target, the targets are here. This guy had a lot. So the more you ablate it, the more targets that you end up having, actually, because you create additional damage and it combines with the fibrosis and sets, the, sets up the stage for even worse arrhythmias. So, um, yeah, that's another patient. So anyways, we 
concluded the study. These patients have been followed now for about a year and something, a year and a half. And actually, right, the, yeah, for m most of them are more than a year and a half. Anyway, so we are very um, optimistic, cautiously. Of course, you've got to be cautiously optimistic because you never know what's going to happen if you have a bigger trial. But we were able to determine to eliminate persistent atrial fibrillation in these patients 100%. And so um, some of them in one um, had a flutter, came up with macro reentrant tachycardia, and turned out, so the, the clinicians, I just want to point this out, they don't have to ablate all of the targets. If they think a target is dangerous, maybe it's close to a place where they don't want to go, it's up to them to not do that. So one patient came back with a flutter, and it turned out the, when they ablated the flutter at a location that we had predicted to ablate, but they didn't do it. Um, so that was really good. Um, anyways, so that's, um, that's the result of, uh, of this study. Um, so it's not published. We've written the paper, and then we'll see where we go with that. Uh, while we were preparing the paper for, for publication, somebody referred a patient to Hopkins Hospital to have a simulation-driven ablation. I have no idea how they know, probably from a forum like this where I've showed it, but somebody's heard about that. I must have shown that at a clinical meeting. So they, they got referred, and we ablated them. We predicted them. There was a woman. She went home. So, uh, you know, that was done, but... I, um, she was referred to the doctor that was the most skeptical about the approach. So um, we'll see how that goes. Anyways, um, we are continuing to do that also for the ventricles. We want to do the same in patients with um, ventricular tachycardia, for whom, again, very often the targets cannot be predicted. The ventricles are more complicated in the fact that they are thick, and the approach is always endocardial, and the mapping is endocardial, so you may not access the target. So we want to do um, this and predict where to ablate. So I wanted to do the study at Hopkins, but in the United States, you receive what's called Institutional Review Board. Uh, it has to be reviewed. Of course, every way it has to be reviewed for patient safety. Okay, they didn't give me that. So ventricular tachycardia is... Uh, little diseases, right? The atria are not. So they thought that that might be a, um, a safety risk doing a study like that. So they told me that they would not give me a permission to do the study until I get an approval from FDA, which is the governing body, the regulatory body in the US. And so meanwhile, I decided, OK, while I'm submitting documents for, for that, I was able to pass the protocol in two other institutions. So University of Pennsylvania, I have a, a collaborator there, a doctor, who actually enrolled um, two patients, and we were able to do that. And so you can see here um, the red um, balls are the tips of the ablation catheter. The sort of purple is our prediction. And so they ablated basically where we predicted the problem with this was that um, for atrial arrhythmias, we typically get a few days to do that. And you know, your segmentation takes time. And then this is a research software. So it takes a long time to run. And you do like many pacing locations. So it's quite cumbersome. You know, I mean, in the future, I so hope that we can solve this problem of scalability. But right now, for the ventricular tachycardia, the patient comes the day before the, pr the procedure. And so sometimes they scan the MRI in the afternoon, and we have to provide the targets in the morning. So we work all night, and um, there was one time they like call at 10 o'clock in the morning, where are the targets? The patient is on the, you know, on the, in the procedure room. It's been you know, sedated. We are waiting. Stuff like that. It's very, very complicated to get these um, simulations. Um, but um, in the, for, for the ventricular... Um, Ablation, we, as I said, we did these prospective studies. We did two at University of Utah, and we did a lot of retrospective studies, about 30 patients. And so I'm really happy. Three days ago, the paper got accepted in Nature Biomedical Engineering. So this is, we are doing the final documents for the submission, but it will be published. That's on the ventricular side. The atrial is going to be submitted. 
Anyway, so that's where we are going with um, the clinical studies. This is the end of my talk. I want to acknowledge very much the people that make everything possible. My lab has very dedicated and very hardworking people, and also the most amazing is the clinical team who actually said, you know, believed me, because it's one thing to say, okay, I can do that great modeling. Another thing is to convince a clinician who is treating a patient to do something like that. And I owe to these people everything, because without that clinical team that believed in me and in our work, that would have never happened. So um, the clinicians at Hopkins, at UPenn, also I worked with the Bordeaux, um, and um, other collaborators. And um, my lab, as I said, they are very, very dedicated people, and they made me do this. Oh, I have to acknowledge my support, the, the money that goes into this study. So I am very lucky to have one of the very rare awards, which is an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, which is for crazy project. It's high risk, high reward grant. So that, that's what enabled the clinical studies. Otherwise, um, nobody would fund that crazy stuff. Um, and we have other um, support, but um, as I said, the people that do all this work in my lab, they made me do this picture. Um, they think that we have special powers. Um, anyways, um, this is the end of my talk. We also have openings. If anybody is interested in postdoctoral positions, please let us know. We have a lot of projects going on, so I would be happy to talk to you. So um, I'm happy to take any questions if you guys have. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk and especially going from the engineering towards the clinical part. So are there any questions? Hi, thanks very much. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you said that uh, you are not doing any personalized electrophysiology, but it seems that for prognostic and diagnostic and... Oh, no, no, I am doing it. I don't, I, no, I definitely am uh, doing it. I don't know. I, I said I'm not doing the mechanics. Okay, the but... The electromechanics, the, the mechanics, we are not there at the personal level. But for the electrophysiological propagation models, are those patient-specific as well? Or? All of that is patient-specific, the entire, everything. Yep, so may, maybe I'm not explaining myself right, because uh, the heart and the geometry is all patient-specific, but the, the model for the simulations, all the ion currents and, and everything, is that also... Does, okay, does I also address account? that by saying I purposefully do not want to have that patient-specific, because patient-specific means invasive measurement, and I don't want to have that. Indeed, so my question is, do you think you w would get any improvement from making them patient-specific, or is it just enough to leave um, them as they are? Even if there is huge improvement, we can't do it. We don't want to do it. Okay. So you have to come up with an alternative way. So what we are doing is we are using this, um, this methodology, and then I have a clinical fellow that's doing measurements in the clinic in cohorts of patients, and he's creating our own ionic models from these groups of patients. But we have separate groups of patients uh, divided in diseases. So that's going to improve the law. We already tested that. So that gives, although, to be honest, what does improvement mean, right? You guys are engineers. I'm an engineer. For me, it was very difficult to accept that I can generate a model and somebody will ask me, ooh, maybe your current is not exactly what it should be. And then you look at the clinic and they're going with this catheter and like, yeah. Right, so what is, what is accuracy here? The whole notion of accuracy in my own engineering, I have physics undergraduate degree. To me, this was like psychologically unacceptable until you figure out that's the only way to go. So the, the assessment of accuracy will come from a clinical outcome. If it works, then it works. So, and yeah, this takes me to the next question which, which is, what do you think is the biggest challenge to make this into like a clinical software, like put it uh, regularly in clinics to plan? So I, it's not my job to do that. I feel there should be a startup. I actually have a startup, but that's another story, but only for one of the applications. 
it should be, you know, um, I view my role as an inventor, as a, somebody who drives this. Um, but I don't see my role as bringing it to the clinic like as a routine clinical tool because I don't have neither the knowledge nor the capability nor the interest to do that. That's a completely different. But I am ho hoping that all this can be scaled up. It can be made much faster. My hope is that that could happen. I can't do it in my lab. That's not possible because then I will stop you know, expanding the applications or doing new inventions and so forth. So it's always this. You, I would like that to happen, but I can't do it. Thank you very much. Other questions? Thanks a lot. So my question was partly uh, answered right now. Uh, I also wanted to ask about that you mentioned this uh, hard working nights uh, when you receive data in the evening and then you had to bring the results in the morning. And I was, uh, I, I, I was wondering, is it like fully automated pipeline that you have now or is it, does it require a lot of kind of human work? No. Do you think segmentation is automated? No. I mean, you can get the ventricular geometry potentially um, you know, automatic, but my goodness, the scar, it's all, no, it's not, so it's it, not. It will re require some human routine work. It has, the, the segmentation mm -hmm. does require. Um, for the rest of the, the stuff, we have scripts, so you can just run the script and it's fine. Um, but no, segmentation has to have, a, you know, and sometimes we have two people doing it, right? One and then you check with the other and so forth. You gotta have to do that. You guys should come up with something better, please. I am not an expert in that. Give us a better segmentation. But look at clinical radiology. Most of it is also by hand, so. Yeah, it's true. The first area to be replaced by machine learning, I heard it like. Exactly, I'm waiting but, on that. But there are like radiologists like lobbying it and uh, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. That's another discussion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, is that the, the segmentation, the bottleneck for, for the um, The simulation, so there are two bottlenecks. One is human bottleneck, and the other is how long the simulations run. So the human, the, from the manual perspective, that's the segmentation, yes. The simulations run some time, of, you know, take some time. The biggest problem with the simulations is the following. Not that it necessarily runs whatever time it runs, but we run it on a cluster that is, belongs to the university. And then, okay, so you get the patient, you segment it, and you have to run it. Well, what if your simulation doesn't run on the queue until tomorrow, right? So that's the horror of it. So, um, you know, how do, we, how do we make it so much um, lighter the software so I don't have to run it on a cluster where I am scared that I may not have the processor, you know, enough processors to run it, right? So we have, I, now I know the boss of the, you know, computational center, so I call it, we have a patient and stuff like that. But these are like personal things, you know, all that is a bottleneck, you know. It's, look, how many patients I have done? Not that many, right? Well, you know, on a scale of like one heart from what I was doing before to that, it's a lot. But on a scale, on a clinical scale, it's not. So I would like to see it. Yeah, you guys, please. <laughs> better segmentation, uh, better, you know, faster running of these electrophysiological models. They're very stiff um, problems. So any methodology is very helpful. Um, I read many papers about simulation of uh, genetic disease, and uh, all of them use uh, on implement only one uh, possible changes in the channel or only one uh, variant of genetic mutation. For example, Borgada syndrome has about 10 variants, uh, one QT has about more than 20 variants, but uh, our work in simulation use only one variant because people has information from patch clamp and it uh, result was measured. Uh, currently exists some publication when people implement, uh, express the channel from genetic information, measure patch clamp and some companies provide this service. Uh, some uh, people 
um, say about uh, fully computable uh, computer simulation of the channels and uh, uh, for some channels possible to write the equations uh, for implementing the uh, in the electrophysiology electrophysiological model but uh, and it's look like possible in state of the art but no one model really implement the uh, genetic information of many patients in the model why the gap of our knowledge or what is a technical problem which no, may be not obvious but um, so um, in a way I'm not a good person to answer that because I don't really we had the study on genetic mutation but this was a particular person we used the particular person's mutation we used the particular person's um, channel current and so forth I am I don't have too much of a so when you look from the clinical perspective genetic diseases take one percent of all the arrhythmias and the rest is the cases that I'm showing so from my own pers perspective what I want to do is not really look at genetic diseases because you can't make that much of a difference um, it is very interesting because it's so clear you have change in current and you have a result when you have a messy patients like the one that we have it's really complex so um, you know there are more people working on genetic diseases and I'm going to leave it to them to figure it out we did just this patient because it was the specific one but whatever the society comes for, with I'm happy with any other questions maybe also one that I had is like I was a little bit puzzled or at least intrigued by the fact that you found from your very high resolution MRIs that the what the channels that would give you arrhythmias are about two millimeter in, yeah. in white yeah. and not not wider yeah did you speculate on what the reason would be or yes. actually we had to look into it right I'm just going through the study very mm -hmm. yes so it has to do with so how does an arrhythmia get set up so in order for arrhythmia to get set up, you have to have a block somewhere, right? You have to have a block, and then a, the propagation goes around. Where would the block occur? If you have a wide channel, the block won't occur, typically, right? So that part of a wide channel typically doesn't get involved. It's where the block occurs originally. And where it gets set up, it comes back there. And so that's one of the reasons. So we've even looked into the mechanisms why block occurs in these, and you have, you know, sort of a... So if it is much narrow, then it, it can propagate. Propagation fails sometimes. If it is too wide, it just goes through it. So you have this intermediate uh, thickness where block occurs, and that's what's the mechanism. You say you don't do any mechanical things, but do you think that mechanoelectrical feedback might be relevant? We've done a lot things? of studies on mechanoelectrical feedback, a lot. I didn't present that because I... I wanted to give you a flavor from one end to the other to the clinical. I don't have that for the mechanoelectrical stuff. We have done a lot of mechanistic studies. We have done, you know, uh, I have papers and papers on stretch activated channels and other stuff, all that. We have papers on sort of electromechanical delay that is um, different throughout the heart and so forth. But I don't have a clinical flavor to it. I don't, I'm not using patient heart. I mean, I'm using some ex vivo scans of, of human hearts, but I don't have a patient work with that, so I just, that's why I didn't present that. Other question here? It, it is oh, working? Ah, uh, no. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna stay with the most specific one because I don't wanna steal your time. In the um, simulations that you show um, infarct-related uh, ventricular tachycardia, uh, you showed that there is a channel that is required to have a ventricular tachycardia. But how did you induce the tachycardia in those specific simulations? Because in the results, you see the, the wave going around the heart, but you don't see how it starts. And you, well. It's basically, we have an automatic sort of a script that um, you paste from many, many locations that are distributed equally, sort of uniformly distributed throughout. So you just paste and then see which one induces. And when it induces, you look where it goes. You know, pacing is everywhere. We pace from the left, from the right, everywhere from the septum, and then you look at the, at the arrhythmias that, that result. There's a question. 
No, so um, maybe before we finish, then I, I will so check whether there are questions from the remote, uh, remote attendees. In the meantime, maybe a little bit of philosophical question, because what I love said, philosophical questions. <laughs> you started with saying that simulations are ubiquitous and that self-driving cars are developed uh. by simulations. But self-driving cars is a model where we know that it will save lives, but as soon as it kills a life, yeah, the car is killed. I know. So how do you deal with this? Because maybe you save lives, but for sure you will miss some. And how do you make sure? Yeah, no, I, it, it's actually really, you're absolutely right. But um, so the difference is that in the self-driving car, there is somebody who's there who gets killed, who is not in a patient. They are there because they're very sick. And so you have an outcome expectation, right? You have somebody who's very who's sick and very sick or been ablated before. You, you, I hate to say it, but it, it's it's just it's the expectation. That's what medicine does. Medicine solves the problem of something that's not natural. That's we are going against nature. While you put a normal pedestrian in a self-drive or a self-driving car kills a pedestrian, it's something completely unexpected. And I think we are much more attuned to reacting to the self-driving car and how many people die in a hospital every, you know, every day. It's a very different, different... Oh, I agree. But when you look at the ICDs, for example, you implant 20 ICDs to save one life, 19 get crazy, but at least this one doesn't die. So if you implant in the wrong one and another one dies... Oh, no, no, wait, you then? absolutely... That's, that's absolutely right, but that's the point I made is that um, this criterion, ejection fracture, is so inaccurate that you let many people that have, I think that's where the biggest problem, the biggest saving of human life will be. So look at this. If I say, I want to use my software to implant less defibrillators, I am coming against Medtronic, uh, Boston Scientific, and every company that produces devices. So I think this is a battle uphill. I am not going to be fighting that battle first. I'm going to fight the other battle. I want to have more defibrillators implanted in people who are let go because the ejection fraction is above 35 percent. That's where we want to start. So we have uh, we have one question. So from uh, Sergio Morales, and but I think you have already answered in there actually. As uh, do you have standard methods uh, for uh, hard geometries uh, to build up the hard geometries from from MRI? Or do you vary the manual segmentations from model to model? So I yeah, guess I, I you don't have I standard answer. methods and no. you do vary, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we try to do as best as possible in terms of segmentation, you know, whatever the new methodologies we try to, you know. But it always ends up being, being manual. There is manual component. We can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, well, I have a question. Um, so I would like to come back to, to biomechanics. So um, I'm a biomechanician. That's, that's Can you help? My, my origin, <laughs> so I'm a bit worried by your results because they are very good. And uh, so it seems that it doesn't really matter, no? Um, well, I mean, the mechanics, you mean? Yeah. Well, the mechanics matter in many, many things. But so let's say um, an atrium, human atrium is in fibrillation. When it's in fibrillation, it's hardly contracting. You can see it. It's hardly, it's just like, it's not contracting, basically. It's not. It's so many waves going, and it's just not slightly quivering. I mean, there is no, there is no real contraction. And that's, that's why in arrhythmias of that type, you know, you can, you know, we might discover later that there needs to be something to be added. But from that perspective, yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, how many elements do your mesh have? You so mean? how many elements, so the, the, the human meshes, the, vin, the ventricular meshes are about 10 million oh. elements. The atrial are about three to four. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's the yeah, discretization, the model discretization is about 350 microns. That's for okay. stability. Uh, sometimes we can go to 400, but you, we, so, you know, you have a mesh generation and what you, the parameter that you, provide is your average element left yes, and th then we provide the number of 350 microns and then of course it's around it you have a histogram okay, of yeah, the yeah. distribution yeah okay thank you 
Any other question? So I think that from the remote audience, there we have no question. So maybe it's just time to thank you again and go for beers. <laughs>